Welcome to this episode of Blether Together, your weekly breakdown of news and politics from Scotland and around the world, coming to you live from the national offices on this Thursday. Thanks very much for tuning in. My name is Stephen Payton. I'm here on behalf of The National. And joining me in the studio today is Angela Haggerty from Common Space. Hello. And Craig Dial, who is a writer and recently published a report on Scotland's uh, potential welfare system if it was an independent country, which we're going to be talking about shortly. As always, though... <laughs> sorry, you didn't give me a chance to say hi there. Um, as always, though, we do want to hear what you are thinking about uh, the conversation that we're having, so please do leave your comments down below. We are watching them throughout the course of the show, and if you want to help us reach a wider audience, then please do give this video a little bit of a share as well. Uh, yeah, which I guess does lead me on to exactly that. So you just published a report um, on what an independent Scotland's potential welfare system could look like. Yes. Um, and, and, and one of the kind of, I guess, focuses of it was that primarily it shouldn't copy the mistakes of the UK. Yes. Now, one of the, the, the lessons in this paper is that when Scotland becomes independent, no matter what we want to do with our welfare system, because it's a reserved system largely, uh, especially the background and in infrastructure like your national insurance numbers and, uh, and whatnot, um, Scotland will need a new system. So we need to design one from scratch. Uh, we're going to be producing a paper shortly on exactly how, you, how, how we think you should do that. But the opportunity of independence is we can look at the failings of the UK system, the, 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 the callous and punitive systems that the, the, gov the uh, Westminster government has put in, um, in, including things like sanctions, and we can avoid these mistakes. We can, we can design a system that works for everyone. Um, and the paper then goes on to suggest some possible policy options. Um, you know, keeping open the the, uh, the debate, uh, obviously. Um, but we look at things like negative income tax that gives you an automatic tax credit if your income falls below a certain threshold. We look at things like a job guarantee scheme instead of uh, job seekers, um, which. Uh, supposedly helps you try and find a job in the, the private market. The, the, the government can simply give people jobs. So there are plenty of projects and opportunities out there that they can look at, they can tie it in with their economic structure and economic policies. Um, and we look at things like the universal basic income, just simplifying the welfare system, giving everybody an automatic payment um, th uh, that, that guarantees a baseline in income for everyone um, it's a policy that's getting talked about at increasingly high levels. Even the UN is now recommending that the UK look at a basic income. Um, whether they do that or um, is up for, for you mm -hmm. to judge. Um, and it carries with it a lot of advantages, like, for instance, um, if you're a student, you want to concentrate on your studies, you have this income to help you help uh, see you through that. Uh, you don't need to spend all your time just working to keep a keep a roof over your head and trying to study at the same time. If you are a carer, gives you gives you help to, to uh, allow you to do that. If you are involved in art or cultural uh, endeavours, you want to take a year out of work to go and write a book, for instance, a universal basic income can do that. You want a guaranteed income to allow you to set up a business, a universal basic income would allow you to do that. So it's, it's definitely a, t a policy worth talking about. I think with the universal basic income and with other kind of, I guess, uh, pilots and ideas like that, yeah. usually the criticism people come back with is, um, but is it cost aid or is this kind of like fantasy economics? Mm. I mean, does your paper kind of go into? It does. It's, 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 it's fully cost aid. It's based on a few uh, other schemes uh, that have been looked at either globally or with a UK focus or with a Scotland focus. Um, the, the thing is, a lot of the a lot of existing benefits, if you've got a universal basic income, you don't need job seekers uh, allowance, you don't need carers allowance and uh, other, uh, some other benefits. Um, a lot of it is, the thing about universal basic income is not so much a cash transfer problem. If you are earning a, an income and I give you, for example, a thousand pounds, but I increase your taxes by a thousand pounds, then so what? Mm. Um, so the the, the 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 costs are laid out in the paper. Yeah. 
So I guess what, what do you think are the biggest mistakes that the UK government can't make? I know you went through yeah. a few of them, but what, I mean, what is it that's just... When a lot of people speak about the welfare system in the UK, generally it's in a very... Um, they view it as being a very disgusting system mm. because of how it tends to treat people. I mean, what do you think are the, the biggest things that we need to make sure that we avoid? This, this is it. It's treating people like an accounting exercise rather than a person. It's uh, treating people as, as an expense rather than a person. Uh, a lot of these sanctions are, are, are there purely to try and get people off the books, to try and find a reason to not give them the, the payment that they're due, that, that, that they often rely on. Um, it's a disgusting way to treat people. Mm. That's just how fundamentally it needs to change. <coughs> to the point that you know, if we became an independent country, that we would need to like, radically rethink how we want to approach that system so that we aren't making the same mistakes. I hope so. <laughs> I mean, the, the UK welfare system is it's inhumane at the moment. I mean, um, I, Daniel Blake, was the big thing in the last year or two that brought attention to it, uh, the Ken Loach film. And it's just appalling what people are living in, the kind of situations that they're finding themselves in, and the way that we've become benefit shamers. You know, we yeah. shame the poor, we shame people that need help, we shame people that are vulnerable. Um, we need to, so, so those are the kinds of things that don't get fixed by tweaking things around the edges. That needs to reframe the way that we, that we view everything. And that's to me what Scottish independence was largely about. And as Craig says, it's a chance to redesign a system with the foundations of it, with the frame completely different, which means that all of the policies and, and everything that exist within it will, will therefore automatically also be radically different. So I think it's, uh, you know, I love the fact that the report brings in the, the basic income, universal basic income, because <clears throat> I think that's a really, really important thing moving forward, because um, it says a lot about the kind of societies that we're going to become, and we're at a real crossroads at the moment, God knows we're at a crossroads, we can see things globally, the way things are changing, not just with the current politics, but with things that we know are coming in the future, and that's why actually welfare is so important, because it's about whether we value human beings as human beings or whether we only value what we can get from human beings. Mm. And that usually means what their worth is to richer people. That's the big question that we've got. So um, as always, these things you know, seem to be about one thing, but they're always about something much bigger. I think, funnily enough, the baby boxes that we've been talking about this week is another issue that's similar. Uh, it's not really about whether the baby box is just you know, good for does it have nice things for babies and will it help reduce rates of this or that? It's actually about saying we value every single yeah. baby born, no matter who they are to, where they are from, we value them all in the same and they all, de de they all deserve the exact same start in life. It's a nice gesture. It might just be a gesture, but it's a good one. And, you know, you, you, you shouldn't sort of, you shouldn't knock that because other things aren't quite right. You should encourage it. Yeah. So... So yeah, there's a, the we grounds for optimism, I suppose, and amongst all the the crazy politics that we've had this week as well. But Craig, would it, I mean, when it comes to things like universal basic income, how realistic now do you think that is? Because people do speak about it much more seriously now than I ever remember it before. It did used to seem like a fantasy. Now it seems like it could actually happen. It's definitely starting to look as if it's a policy of its time. When you've got people at the UN now telling governments this is something you need to seriously consider, mm -hmm. um, then yeah, I could see it as a. Uh, you, you, you can o you can already see some limited trials happening. Mm -hmm. um, there were trials a few decades ago in Canada that were very successful. There are trials running right now in Finland that are showing positive results. And I think the Scottish government, I think, is it Fife and Glasgow councils, mm -hmm. are both considering a trial <coughs> and. Um, th these are going to be fairly limited trials, uh, but it'll be very interesting to see what results they come out with. Yeah, I could definitely, definitely see basic income coming in. It'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see which country does it first, and mm -hmm. I hope but it's is, Scotland. Is it true also that the the universal basic income has some support from the right? Um, that there there could be some kind of flaw in that that it could then be used to dismantle what we know is the welfare mm. state give people just a lump sum of money but no other support system or network um, and that in the wrong hands the UBI could actually be something that, that doesn't work in the way that we all think it's going to work. This is true of a lot of policies and yes it's definitely true of, of UBI um, there's a, a right libertarian argument that you can 
instead of the government providing services, you can just give people a cash payment and they can go out and buy their services from mm. the private market. And you could extend it, give everyone a UBI and they can go and buy their health insurance, buy their education. So we need no so NHS, for example, yeah, because we could, we could just buy, covers we, Yeah, we could, we could just buy our, our services as we need them. And if you spend all your money on other things, well, that's your fault. Mm. Um, so, yes, <coughs> when it, it's great that policies like this do have cross-party support. You just need to be aware that the reason for someone's support might not be completely in alignment with yours, but this is normal politics. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is common a lot of a lot of policies. Mm -hmm. My understanding as well that some of the support from the right came not only from, I guess, potentially actually using it as a means to undermine other areas of the state, but also because it's it's essentially creating a smaller government yeah. because you take away the means testing element, yep. you take away the need. Um, to process huge amounts of paperwork if it's just everybody gets a thing and that's it. Then yeah, and actually the, the, the left argue that same point as well, but where the left would say, well, you can take that saving and give everyone slightly more benefits, the mm -hmm. right would say, well, you can just take that saving and, and reduce taxes. Uh, well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I'm curious, so obviously when we're talking about this just now, we're talking about a social security system for Scotland. Yeah. And Coming back to your point that you made earlier on about how, uh, as a country, we be kind of become benefit shamers, mm -hmm. the kind of people that you know, Channel Four is really guilty for all these programs that it runs. Channel about, you know, Five. Like Channel Five. The Channel Four that did Benefit Street, but then right. Channel Five. Channel Five spent about three years since then. With okay, like yeah, just running with like you know, like the program, um, yeah. uh, I'm on benefits and I've got five kids kind of programs yeah. that just like just really um, Fat builds up. Fat and on benefits. Right, exactly. A, I mean, it's really it's 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 as degrading and as explicit as that. The titles of these programs mm. are just awful. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's definitely very much a intentional ideological thing, mm. and, and it does build up over time this idea of people and benefits being lazy as opposed to the reality which is people in a situation where they require security which is ultimately what it comes down to so when you're talking about social security yeah i mean are you also talking about starting to move away from the use of the word welfare um especially the word benefits um because it, it has that undertone of this is something that the the the, the state by its grace has get, has granted you mm. um Whereas a social security is, is about all of us working together to, to, to make sure we don't leave anyone behind, basically. Um, when, when you mentioned earlier the, the baby boxes, I think that's a great example of the power of universalism. I saw a criticism saying, well, why don't we just, just give the boxes to the needy? And someone came back quick as a flash and says, who, who decides who is needy? Mm -hmm. And how needy do you have to be to get one? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the, the, the <coughs> flaw with means testing. Mm. And more than that as well, like, when you start to strip away universals and you take away the core message of it, which yeah. is that you're building a coherent society for everyone, yeah. not take and give. Yeah. It's 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 universal, and yeah. that's the function of it. Um, I'm curious, though, like, oh, you've been doing a lot of work with the papers that you're producing, and uh, we had an interesting criticism this week, not specifically to do with the paper, but rather the, um, the creation of the paper at all. Um, some people looking at you know, when it comes to the discussion around independence, should yeah. we not be focusing on the principle of it rather than the policies of what might potentially come through on the other side of it? Or do you think that, on the other hand, focusing on the potential policies we might have also is part of building up that idea of what an independent Scotland could be? Yeah, I think both both strands are valid. Um, the the fundamental that Scotland will need its own new welfare system, no matter what we do with it. So we may as well look at the opportunities that, that it can bring. Um, I, I, I'm not saying that universal basic income is a necessity. We don't you know, have to pin independence on that policy. Um, but if you want a universal basic income, independence might, independence might be a way of getting it. Mm. And like the baby box and other areas, yeah. it's a statement of intent. Yeah. It's a statement about yeah. the kind of society that you're trying to build. Yeah. And I, I can see why the papers would be a really fascinating way of examining, once again, what a progressive yeah. Republican I mean, Scotland could my, look like. My, my vision for independence might be somewhat different, very different from, from your vision, for mm -hmm. instance, but it, it doesn't mean that we, we, we shouldn't discuss and co compare and contrast those visions. I think also the practicality of these papers is useful in the sense that for, for any potential no or floating voters who love all the ideas that everyone's always talking about but they never actually see anything that make them think that it could happen, that you could translate something from one place and take it to the other place. And when you have policy papers or 
you know, real proper academic think papers. Um, it helps convince people that no, actually, some real serious thought is going into this, some serious research. It's not just a pie in the sky idea. Yeah. These things are actually possible, and it's based on evidence. Like you say, even if it's not necessarily everyone's vision of independence, um, the more the more we have in the pool, I suppose, the more papers we have to look at and explore, I think probably the better. Mm. So big things of the Better Together campaign, or specifically afterwards when it came to talking about devolving powers to Scotland and um, through the Scotland Bill and the Scotland Act, was very much about devolving welfare powers to Scotland. Yeah. I mean, what is the paper at the moment is achievable just now, and do you think we've really kind of lived up to that? Have we been given enough powers to really implement our own welfare system, or are we kind of still kind of fretting around the edges? Well, I think it's only about 17% of total expenditure that's going to be devolved. So it's still, it's not going to be, uh, you know, radical fundamental overhauls. Um, and depending what you do to that, 17% might be the difference between someone struggling and someone actually, you know, uh, regaining a meaningful life. Um, there's always going to be limits to, to, to devolution, though. You know, the, the, the direction of travel is fundament on these largely reserved powers is going to be fundamentally defined by what happens in Westminster. Mm. Is there anything within the paper just now that's implementable with the powers that we're receiving through this new act? Um, you might be able to do some of things like the negative income tax, although we don't have quite enough control over income tax to really properly do it. Um, it would be a bit complicated, uh, there are, and and then you get into the whole argument over you know the reason that the Scottish government didn't uh, increase the top rate of tax is because we don't have control over the definition of income, we don't have control over taxes on on dividends and whatnot. So there's the risk of of uh, people hiding or moving their income around. Um, yeah, when you say what you can and cannot do, it becomes a very complex subject. <laughs> you might be able to do the policy on paper, but will it work in practice? It's, that's, that's maybe a paper in itself. Yeah, exactly. So basically, long story short, <coughs> that's the way to go ahead and have a radically different social security system. Something makes it easier. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you're watching Blether, which is news. Down below, just to kind of go through a couple of them, I guess. Uh, Brian McKay, or McKay, sorry if I'm getting that wrong. Um, can I? You know what? Yeah, let's come back um, to that. The, the, you're right, the, the small, the, the small things, um, they can give you some idea um, for uh, often. cases, you're right that in, unless you have a proper, what's known as a saturation trial, where you take an entire area, um, in Canada did this, they took an entire town and gave everybody a basic income, and other benefits come on, like um, um, you, you start seeing people staying on in school rather than dropping out and getting a job because of the, the low income, you start seeing health, um, pretty, pretty good benefits to uh, health outcomes and especially mental health outcomes. Um, you start seeing effects like being able to, you know, uh, negotiate your, your, your wage and your job conditions because you have the security of an income behind you that if you're, uh, you're not trapped in a job that you can't leave because you can't afford to leave. Um, so you're right, we, we do, if we're going to do more trials, there needs to be some saturation trials. Um, and that's, that's something for Why the government to think about. Why am I never on one of these trials? <laughs> <laughs> To me and say, here, we would like it to be in a try, we'll have some money <laughs> for a while, for a good few months. Why is I mean, it yeah. I'm really hoping I can end up in one of those areas as well, that'd be yeah. great. Um, yep, no, but um, thank you anyway for coming in and having a chat with me today about uh, the paper you released. Yeah. That's absolutely great, and um, I'm glad you're going to stay on for the rest of the show as well. As you if, if you want to read things. the paper, it's on, mm -hmm. on Commonweal's website, all of us first uh, for slash library. Mm. Papers up as well. Yeah, we've got. Well, we're in the are, you allowed, of... are you allowed to say what they are? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mentioned one on um, on on how we do IT systems and the the background infrastructure or how you mm -hmm. revamp something like welfare. Well, that's that's going to be coming up. We've got other papers coming up on um, 
and how Scotland can better manage its en energy infrastructure. We've got papers on central banking, on tax and pensions coming up as well. Hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, and going back to your comments as well, we do have one as well from Ben who's asking. Um, obviously, today we're going to talk about happening in America, Scotland's problem uh, with Nazis. Uh, and yes, we will be talking about Scotland's problem as well as America's. Okay, give me one second just to make sure that we are still. Life. Yes, we are. Great. <laughs> I got a flashing light there, which. Eh. We have to go to the show sometimes, not yeah, realizing it's that been we can cut off. Had to go back and repeat ourselves for it's a little bit. You mentioned that word. It doesn't like it. Just don't. <laughs> don't literally, don't mention the Nazis. <laughs> Just, um, okay, which does bring us on to our next point. Then I guess uh, Theresa May this week kind of failed to fully condemn Donald Trump for fully failing to condemn white supremacists. It's this kind of as I joked, a sort of a conception. It's a failure within a failure, within a failure here. Um, she did come out and say, you know, white, white supremacy was bad, but refused to kind of really engage with the fact that Donald Trump has skirted around the edges or, or when he finally did come out and specifically address um, the fact that white supremacists had ultimately caused violence, led to the death of someone, was he led to, straight up committed to that. Mm. Um, it took 48 hours before he actually addressed it properly. And then he, even then, immediately afterwards, just got right back off script again and started talking about... Uh, ...the reconstruction work of um, Big Ben and that maybe the workers there should not worry so much about their, their uh, health and safety on the job so they can keep the bell ringing. Mm. That says a lot about the government. It says a lot about the government, but uh, the, <coughs> yeah, exactly, she did seem far more concerned about that than the, the potential, like, seeing Nazis on the streets of America who felt they didn't need to wear a hood, which yeah. shows you how, how much that movement's progressed over, well, the very short amount of time that Trump's been in power. I mean, obviously, America has a race problem. America has Nazis. You know, um, that there's no doubt about that, and they have been there. This is not something new, mm. but their newly emboldened nature, I think, is, is is very much a next step for them. And if you do listen to some of the things that they said afterwards, there very much was a focus of this is the beginning of the next thing that we want to sort of um, do. I mean, I don't know. What did you think of Theresa May's statement? It feels like she's something because she feels she has to, mm. but you know, you don't really buy it. There's no real passion in it. I don't believe that she believes what she's saying. So it's disappointing, but not unexpected. But we know why this might be. Um, the UK is about to leave the EU and is looking in the direction of America and other places for trade deals and for support and for security. And that's why Theresa May was so quick to, to, to want to jump in after Trump's election as well and, and make friends and hold his hand if you mm. remember correctly. <coughs> so she's unlikely to want to rock the boat too much on that without knowing uh, exactly where the UK sits with everything, um, which at the moment is in utter chaos and no one's any further forward. We still don't know what's going on. Brexit looks as mad as ever. That's part of it. But, you know, Ruth Davidson as well, I, again, when it comes to these sort of things, she manages to skirt under the radar and, and I don't understand it. Um, when she, she can have such a high profile she put out a tweet condemning Trump, I think, and you know, saying it was shameful or words to that effect. But again, it stops short of really taking her own government and her own party to over someone who's built up enough of a profile that her saying something publicly on that front actually would get some it would get some reports, it yeah. would get some media profile. Um, and she chooses not to do it. I don't see it very me at the moment. Um, it's the same when the um, DP didn't really condemn the fact that they were going into coalition with people who fundamentally thought that she in fact was an abomination and had said so themselves before when it came to LGBT people. Yeah. Um, 
and and did tweet a sort of slightly subversive thing rather than actually tackling it head on mm -hmm. of just like stating this is not an acceptable party to be going into coalition with whether that's informal or you know whatever form of it it's just not okay and um, given their history and given their supposed values especially at a time when it is like this discussion signaling. Virtue signaling, yeah, I yeah. think that actually is virtue signaling because these are people in positions of some power who are, you know, who <laughs> say things in social media but then blatantly refuse to actually use the power that they have that we don't have yeah. to back up what they're saying. It's really, really, yeah. But mm. we're seeing the pattern, like you say, there's a DUP with Davidson's behaviour over that and, uh, and now this and there's been various other things. So it's, it's not really a surprise, but... It's very, very sad that we are living in a country where our leaders and high-profile politicians and figures can't take the strongest position against what we're seeing in America, that it's very lacklustre and, you know, I was almost going to swear there, actually, I better watch my language. I would, I would love to see Davidson and maybe a few others put on a panel like Question Time and... Mm. and, and just asked the questions and been made to answer them. Yeah, I mean, that'd be exciting. But I mean, it's that not the politicians are going to answer yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, so this is the question then, right? We've had the situation in America right now where a woman was literally murdered by Nazis in broad daylight. Trump failed to condemn it, then sort of did, then kind of said the left were actually to blame, and then did a press release where he sort of defended the Nazis talked about a winery that he owned and then left because who knows what's even going on there anymore. And now the questions came back round to a state visit. Like, will Trump come to the UK for the state visit that he's been putting off for a while now? I mean, do you see that happening? Do either of you think that he'll well, actually be already, welcome here now? They, they've already delayed it because they knew what he was going to be facing when he comes here. And that's not changed, if anything, that's going to be more ferocious, I would think. So yes, ideally what I think world leaders should be doing is making is using the, the ability that they have there to sort of shut the door on them and say, we're not going to deal with you, we're not going to deal with this country as long as this is becoming a serious threat in the world again. And, and stop it early, you have to stop it before it becomes a much more serious thing. That's ideally what we'd like to do. Failing that though, what I think people want to make sure is that if Trump comes for a state visit, he knows about it, basically. Yeah, he will know. Is that he will know all over the UK about it, and so will the rest of the world, that it will be the strongest possible response that we can put up. And, you know, I've got the feeling people are going to be up for that. Mm. And I think something we need to be careful about as well when discussing this, not just in terms of, like, Trump's state visit, but not to act as if this isn't a problem that's going in the UK just now mm -hmm. as well. That this isn't like, oh, we can go protest Trump, because you know he's kind of become a figurehead for it, and then that's us. We've done our bit because it isn't. This is something that we actually have to deal with here and now. Um, as one of our commentators was saying earlier on, um, the Govan Hill Baths in Glasgow, um, which is a really excellent community hub that is kind of like for all the different um, cultures in that area to kind of come together and 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 work together. Um, that was uh, graffitied with kind of racist. Um, slogans and Britain First stuff written on it. I think yesterday or the day before. Like we have a problem here as well, and, and mm -hmm. we need to obviously address that too. Um, and and I do wonder how much the sort of like emboldening of the far right in America is going to have an impact here as well. Well, I think it has an impact everywhere. I think that's why people were so terrified at the the election of Trump because whether people like it or loathe it, America seemed to be the leader of the free world. So if this is the behaviour of the leader of the free world, then that's, that's of course going to have an impact. It's the legitimising nature of something. You know, when I was growing up, I remember thinking that the Nazis were something in the past because they had been defeated and we understood that that was evil, that there was no question around that. And the, you know, neo-Nazi movements as we knew it back then, and we were talking like 20 years ago, was, um, you know, it was very much considered a nutty fringe thing that, yeah. you know, these were people in society that you're unlikely to even ever meet. They're so out there. Um, so th what this does is, is it undoes that, particularly for young people, where it, it, it no longer becomes a, an understood thing. It becomes a debate. And then mm. that becomes very, very dangerous because this cannot be a debate. But, you know, but what we do have which they perhaps didn't have in the same way in the 1930s and around those times as we have history. We have fairly recent history where we have seen exactly what happens um, when this happens. 
And we have to remember that the majority of people in America didn't actually vote for Trump. They voted for Clinton. It was the American electoral system that allowed Trump to get in. And of the people that did vote for Trump, yes, there will be a, an American hard right there, but it doesn't represent all of Trump's voters either. So we're still talking about something that can be dealt with. You, when you think about the National Front in the UK as well, a few decades ago, that at, at one point was actually a much bigger force than the far right seems to be, at least in numbers on the ground. Um, it, that was that was bigger in recent history than it is now in the UK. So these are not yet at the, at the level of things that cannot be dealt with, but it's going to take a real committed, concerted, dedicated effort from everyone involved. And I think it needs to have a street presence as well. It has to be, um, you know, people have to make it clear visibly that it won't be accepted because there's a great video going around actually of one of the, the Nazi guys in America, is it? Um, who suddenly realises that everyone knows what he's been up to and yeah. he's crying like a baby yeah. and they're like you know it's not that hard it's not that hard actually to take these people down yeah. it's really not but you have to stand up to them you really need to stand up to them they're bullies so it's going to take a bit of time but it's going to be a fight but it's definitely you know um it's definitely winnable i think mm -hmm. everyone feels a bit defeated at the moment but you know we need to pick ourselves up Mm. What was it someone said just after the Brexit vote when we had that surge of uh, racial racial violence, uh, or down in England especially, uh, it, someone said it wasn't so much that leave the leave vote made everyone racist, it just made the racists feel that everybody agreed with them. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's now we need the politicians and the people to be confident in saying, no, we do not agree with you, your views are abhorrent. Mm. And I think we need to... we. We need to be looking in the direction of newspapers like The Sun, Daily Express, The Daily Mail as well and, ex and accepting the role that they have played in making this and amplifying this, giving columns to people like Katie Hopkins, even LBC to the credit they did eventually sack her. But this sort of shock jock thing of, of just getting someone to say the most controversial yeah. thing uh, that gets everyone talking is so dangerous when you're mm -hmm. talking about people's lives. People are, you know, Heather Hare has been murdered, 32-year-old women murdered for protesting these people. It's far more people than that have died, and usually when it's minorities, sometimes those numbers don't even get counted properly. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the, there's is, yeah. The, 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 it's, this fight's going to need to come from a number of approaches, I think is what I'm trying to say. But it is, it is, it's people like um, being put up in these like pedestals. It's like, oh, it's just edgy, or oh, it's just a bit of a joke, or or, or everything else. It's well, always things always used the, to like, it's excuse. Always, it's always white people that exactly. are never actually affected by it that think that you know it's no big. It's deal. always a bit of a joke. Exactly. It's always those who are not actually suffering that oppression, mm -hmm. um, and and that's something we really need to challenge as well. Also, this idea that's kind of coming from very much an ivory tower perspective of well, I think if you'll find that the far left and the far right are actually very similar, and it's like no. No, that's not how this works. It's um, it was like I saw someone describe it as almost like it's like a dog looking at the approach, um, or a dog looking at the argument and just hearing angry voices and going everyone's bad, but not being able to listen to the actual language being used and then hear what people are actually saying. Um, that's the fundamental part. It's like they they aren't the same. One people are talking about literally oppressing or wiping folk off the planet, and other people are talking about creating an inclusive society mm. and standing up against racism and bigotry. It's like, that's not the same thing. We can't act like it is, and we can't continue to um, allow that message to go unchallenged as well. Yeah. If, if we have to challenge racism, then we also have to challenge the people who seem to put anti-racists on the same level as the people that they're against. It needs a very, very visible response. Because, so, you know, the biggest danger, actually, in these situations, I think, isn't necessarily the neo-Nazis that are going to be out on the streets. It's the people who may just sit back and say and do nothing the people that become complicit in these things because they begin to get frightened of what's going on. And if the only people that they see on the streets are Nazis, um, creating violence, harming other people, they're going to become fearful for themselves and it becomes a lot easier at that point to just shut up, especially if you're white, because it's not going to affect you really if you don't, if you don't put up a fuss. You just pretend it's not happening and get on with your life. And that's exactly what's happened in situations previously where these kinds of like, you know, where, where these things have led to atrocities. So you need to have a visible, very visible response to it to make it clear that um, that that it's not going to be that easy. And so mm. I, I hope that I hope we're gonna see you know, but we saw that with the women's march, that was massive, that was way bigger than anyone thought it was gonna be. 
um, the anti-Trump movement. And as you say, it's not just about Trump, but that has come to symbolise, I think, the global effort now again, right thing. So that's still pretty strong, I would say, in the UK, and people are gearing up for protests against that. And the ADL, for example, the SDL, whenever they have some protests, there's always counter-protests. There's a lot of anti-fascist protesters that have been doing this stuff for years and years. Hope Not Hate is a great or haven't checked it out, have a look. Um, they do some great work. They actually find out more about who exactly map out the far right um, and find out what's going on. It's actually run, I think, by a guy who used to be part of the far right and kind of came to his senses. Mm -hmm. So he knows what it's about. So there are things out there and you can get involved and you have a duty. You have a duty. We all have a duty to get involved. I thought I wasn't sure if you were going to answer. And you have a duty to go out there and just... Just punch some Nazis <laughs> and just <laughs> take it <laughs> and run with it. Okay, uh, <laughs> we're coming into the last 10 minutes, so I'm going to move on to the last thing I want to talk about today, which was, of course, uh, the Brexit Customs Union mm. chat from David Davis. So David Davis kind of dropped this plan uh, two days ago? Yesterday? No. Could, yeah, it was yesterday. Um, thank you. Uh, of um, okay, well, here's what we'll do. We'll just we'll set up a temporary customs union, and so so just quick card for anyone who doesn't know what the customs union is. The customs union in the EU is essentially that um, it means that goods that are cleared in one country in the union don't need to be subjected to tariffs when they're moving into other ones. So it's like kind of once it's in the union, that's it. You can move it around. You don't need to keep getting it checked, and it all kind of fits under the same regulations. But another part of that as well is that it means that you can't negotiate kind of bilateral trade deals with countries outside of that union, um, otherwise things can get in that haven't been checked or that don't have the right tariffs and so on. And, and the UK has basically said, okay, how's this? What if we have a temporary custom union where we keep trading with everyone in the EU, but also we can start trading with everyone else? And, and, and it's, we've had this conversation so many times almost joking about the UK viewing itself as being just so special. It's like, what if we just got everything we wanted? Mm -hmm. And it feels like that again. I mean, it got shot down immediately. Like, Guy Verhofstadt immediately tweeted, like, this is a nonsense. This is never going to happen. Like, and, and, and it's like, we're getting further into the Brexit um, process and these papers are coming out that are just so well thought out. It's wild that this is the process we're going through just now. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Is it possible? Could it work? Would anyone allow it to work? No. <laughs> That's a simple answer. Remember when they said they couldn't tell us the, the, their plans because they had to keep their cards close to their chest? Yeah, maybe this is why. And now they put them on the table and it turns out it's like a beer mat, a Monopoly utility card. And... <laughs> yeah. Just like a, a, a slightly the bent bin, Uno card, yeah. Bent, yeah. <laughs> How are they coming up with this? I mean, this is... These are, these are the Tories. These are people that go to these big fancy private schools that cost loads of money and the policy people and they're all dead smart and intellectual and they all mix around the circle. And I think we all have this sense of, you know, even if they're rich and privileged, at least they're probably sort of clever. I mean, how is this stuff getting through? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because everyone voted on a thing that they didn't know what it was and they're sort of now kind of scrambling and... I think coming to terms with a little bit of where the UK actually stands. But it's almost like it, it shows some sort of ignorance about how things even work as that's, it is just now. That's and that's what's obvious. scary about it. Mm. I mean, we, we should have a better understanding of where we are. And that it seems like we don't even have that. It's, it's astonishing and, and insane at this stage to think that we are going to be ready by the time the Brexit deadline yeah. comes. The Commonweal a few months ago published a, a paper on how, how you could create a, a, a frictionless smart border um, and we're, we're going to be probably talking about that a bit more in, in, in the future um, but there's, a, there's a, a big worry that even if you know we come up with a or the UK comes up with a reasonable plan can the UK actually manage the customs because you know about a decade ago it merged customs and excise mm -hmm. into HMRC mm -hmm. And now it's been driving down the budget of HMRC to the point where it's not even effective at collecting tax anymore, never mind doing the customs part. So it's, it's very possible that the UK just, well, the UK is already being fined by the EU for, for letting cheap Chinese goods through the, the, the customs uh, barriers. Um, 
So that problem's only going to get worse if, if, unless something very serious has been done. I saw someone comment the other day, if we were leaving the customs union, you would expect that right now they would be building customs posts in, in Dover in preparation. They're not. What's going on? Where's the plans? Where's the, where's the plans for when we leave this customs union? It's just not happening. You're right. It's, it's either they don't think we're going to leave or they're just not thinking at all. I don't know what's it's, what. It's, it's frightening. It's actually frightening, the, the idea that we're getting towards this deadline and whether we're prepared or not, the EU's not really going to care. Um, they'll, be, they'll be keeping themselves secure. Uh, but... Britain really could be left in unprecedented Look <laughs> kind of terms that we can't even imagine at the moment where we come out of these political structures and have nothing really to replace them with, nothing substantial, is really terrifying. It leaves it sort of means that we could be held to ransom by anyone just to, to get the support that we're going to need um, to, just to get through the, the, the few years after that. Look at it this way. Uh, imagine if we had conducted the first India the way they are conducting Brexit. Mm. Uh, we were expected to have every every T crossed, every I dotted, mm. uh, and <laughs> we were supposed to have this vote. And then eighteen months later, we would be a completely independent country. Mm-hmm. We're now what fifteen, sixteen months after the Brexit vote, and we still don't have a semblance of a plan. What is going on? Yeah, it's 50 months that's later true, and it's uh, releasing papers that people are going, no, immediately to. Yeah. Because, of course, like, it's just not going to be, it's not going to function. Keep, we keep coming back to the question of, is Britain actually going to leave the EU? I am seriously concerned that what they're doing right now is to try and put the EU in a position of saying your plans are, are obviously useless and then the UK can storm out of the negotiations, flip the table over and say the EU is being unreasonable and, and walk out and blame all the ills that follow after that on those people in Brussels who wouldn't negotiate reasonably. Yeah. So possibility. And there's something, it possibly there's something someone, like, someone did say that a while ago, that um, it had been leaked that Theresa May was planning to walk away regardless of the outcome. Um, to do with like, I, I can't remember what specific thing it was, but it was one part of the negotiations that they were going to walk away regardless because they knew they couldn't get a good deal. There's been whispers of that going on for the last six, eight months. But the general least. election result would, would suggest that the public's not going to swallow that quite as easily. Yeah. I mean, this was supposed to be the big vote for the hard Brexit and they lost the majority. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and remember, the, the vote to leave the EU was only 52% to 48 It's not like it was an overwhelming majority of people. So I think, that, I think they're going to have a hard time selling that. I think Remainers are actually you know, feeling like, well, democracy has spoken, we'll wait and see what happens. You know, there's, a, there's a bit of that going around for a lot of Remainers. But um, when things start to fall apart rapidly, you know, I don't think people are going to be waiting to see what happens for very long before they start panicking. So, mm. all, all I'm asking is a basic level of com- competence from the people negotiating this, and I'm really not seeing it. Well, do you know? And it, what, a, what, a, what a huge thing to ask. <laughs> you're you're going to look back on like things like calling the snap general election and yeah. just think that that was incredibly mm. irresponsible given everything that needed to be done. Yeah. To spend time Again, doing that. Again, imagine Alex Salmon did that six months after a yes vote. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, not too bad. But uh, that does start to bring us towards the end of the show. That's just about to run it out of time. So, as always, I'm going to finish with um, the weirdest story I found this week, which is, of course, that a um, six part film based on essentially Nigel Farage, the movie, with a 60 million budget, has been essentially approved to tell the story of Brexit. It's six part film. They make it's six films. I don't know if it's six films or if it's going to be six parts to make a full film or like a TV series. It's, it's, it's a little bit vague at the moment. Who's but this? well, that, a little bit I, vague at the moment. That could be a yeah. good title. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's um, it's it's going to be based on Aaron Banks' book, The Bad Boys of Brexit. Oh God, they really love themselves, don't they? Oh, right, exactly. I mean, it's a vanity project. But it's going to it's going to just um, sixty million pounds spent to create this like weird fan movie of Brexit that I imagine will just like maybe dr- like, just drift over a little bit some of the stuff of like Nigel Farage standing in front of that super racist breaking point poster or the murder of an MP no 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 we'll just, we'll just drift over all that and, and you know the worst part is I reckon it becomes this like story of like this like plucky young upstart 
Mr. Farage taking on the, 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 the baddies and, and just, oh, winning. It's quite and dangerous, everything. actually, though. Oh, it's going to be you know, hugely they're, they're revisionist. Jumping yeah. in, yeah, the, uh, the first opportunity is to write the history of what Brexit was and how it happened. Yeah. Fun game weird. for the comments. Mm. Assuming Farage isn't playing himself, who would you, ha who would you put in the role and why? It's a good question. And actually, <laughs> it's interesting, like, I've written right here, who'll play Farage, because that's the question I was going to come to the two of you with. So who, who, who would you think who's know. going to play for Ash? Yeah, exactly. I can't think. I can't. I can't. I really wouldn't want anyone to be inflicted with that role. I don't think. <laughs> but you know, when it comes to Nigel Farage and Aaron Bash, I, I would be amazed if they didn't want to play themselves. It, yeah. <sighs> Uh, you know, they, they might want to. That'd the be incredible. Chocolate they hate themselves, they really would. <laughs> if they played themselves, I'd watch it just because I know it would be awful. And it would be. That would be enjoyable in and of itself. Okay, who do you think? An Andrew Farage. Let's get Donald Trump to do it because he's got form from Home Alone too. That amazing cameo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't he know. was in the, a, an episode of The Fresh Prince of Bel Air that I was watching the other day as well. Donald Trump. So he was. Mm. Yeah. Back a bit. Yeah. It's always been um, a bit of a self promoter. That's <laughs> That's for sure. I don't know. Okay, who would play Farage? I think it'd have to be the most Britishy British person in the world. Jacob Rees Mogg. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good show, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's definitely, you know what? He it feels right. It should be like an old boys club where we just keep giving everyone <laughs> jobs. But yeah, that does bring us to the end of the show. Um, all the same, please on do that keep. Lovely yeah, note. I know, on that lovely note. Please do keep leaving your comments down below about who you think are gonna, is going to play Nigel Farage because uh, I just still want to hear them. Um, but yeah, anyway, that brings us to the end. So thank you very much uh, to everyone who tuned in and watched and left a comment down below. Thanks for taking uh, part in our show. Thank you to Angela and to Craig for joining me today Good as job. well. We'll be back again next week at 3 p.m. as always to talk about everything that happens between now and then. And uh, if you did c miss most of this video, uh, what you can do is you can actually download the podcast and catch up on all, all of it there by subscribing to the Blade of the Gunner podcast uh, and whichever app you use for doing that. <laughs> so that's an option. Anyway, thanks very much, and we'll see you all next week at 3 p.m. Bye. Bye. Bye.